This session is co-sponsored, as the last one was, uh, by the Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference. Uh, the uh, video of the session will be available, uh, I believe, on the website of, uh, of the CPDP conference. It will also be available on the CFP website. Uh, that's what co-sponsorship means in the modern era. Uh, you, uh, you appear on both, both websites. Uh, we're going to uh, move fairly quickly. I know we're a little bit behind schedule here, not too far behind schedule. Uh, I just want to say a few opening words, and then I'm going to turn, turn the uh, uh, session over to the, uh, to the panel. Uh, we have a very uh, distinguished panel. Uh, this session, as I said, deals with uh, uh, the question of uh, the American and the European approach to privacy when it comes to law enforcement. Uh, there is at least a perception, uh, I'll let the panelists discuss whether or not it is a reality, but there is at least a perception, uh, certainly on the, on, here on the European side of the Atlantic, uh, that there is a significant difference uh, in the way in which uh, our, two, uh, uh, our two continents approach uh, issues of commercial privacy. Uh, th that is a perception that is shared by uh, uh, at least much of civil society in, in the United States. Uh, there, is, there are very mixed views about whether or not uh, re the approach to law enforcement issues and national security issues uh, are actually all that different. So that would be the subject that, that we'll talk about here today. Uh, our first speaker is, is Simon Davies. Uh, Simon, as many of you know, uh, was the founder and the first Secretary General of Privacy International. Uh, Simon has really been a critical thinker on privacy issues. Uh, we've asked Simon, who is the co-host of this session, uh, to uh, try to put this issue in some perspective. So, Simon. Thank you, Barry. Um, before I begin on this subject matter in hand, um, you'll see on the program that I uh, am, am slotted to infest you for 15 minutes at 6 o'clock. I'm going to get that over with in two minutes right now, uh, and then we can at least have a more relaxing uh, time frame for this panel, which will, I am sure, become very controversial. Um, two things I just need to mention to you. The first is at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, uh, the LSE uh, and, and privacy surgeon will be publishing a major report on the future of privacy. and. Um, if you go to privacysurgeon.org, you'll see uh, all, the, all the gory details. Many of the people in this room have contributed, about 170 contributors to this report to identify the top issues for the coming year. EU-US relations being one of them. No, not in the top 10, I have to say, but very, very close. Um, so well worth a look. And the second is I want to do a pre-announcement of an international competition for the best campaigning ideas for privacy. This is called Privacy Quest. Uh, we were hoping to actually launch it today, but we were all behind schedule. So um, we'll use the networks as they exist to notify you in the next three weeks of the launch of this exciting international competition. Um, as I say, to the matter in hand, um, this matter of transatlantic relations, uh, certainly in the 27 years I've been involved in privacy, has been a, a key issue. And uh, Barry talks about perception, and I agree. There is a perception that this is a, a somewhat one-sided affair. And on further analysis, the development of an EU data protection framework, which is centered on trust and consent, would appear to make the relationship even more one-sided. We talked this morning at a, an invitation breakfast about the importance of transparency, the importance of due process and accountability. And I'm afraid from where I stand, and, and I, I'm aware that there are differing views on this, the relationship between uh, uh, the US and the EU is anything but transparent or accountable. And I would be delighted to hear the, the variance of views on this panel that, that might uh, contest that perception. But as we know, for decades, the UCUSA National Security Agreement has been shrouded in secrecy and therefore non-accountability. Even now, uh, there are unaccountable processes uh, in action 
to develop a special relationship. And by special relationship, of course, we mean circumventing due process. That's what special relationship means. Um, if I was to, and I don't want to be provocative, Stuart particularly, I don't want to be provocative, but, um, but one only has to look at the extradition arrangements to discover the one-sided nature and the, uh, let's say, hypocrisy of the relationship between the EU and the US. Um, anyone familiar with, with uh, international law will know that the extradition arrangements are one-sided um, and, and, and brazenly so. I think those who are the um, advocates for accountability within the new EU framework will not want to see a repetition of the extradition framework uh, g g coming to haunt us for the next 30 years with our personal privacy. So that having been said, uh, in an entirely non-provocative way, I, I'd like to, uh, to pass it back to, to Barry and the panel. Thank you for those non-provocative comments, Simon. Uh, we're going to turn to our panel. We, we're going to ask our panelists uh, to speak for about six minutes uh, each. Uh, we will take the panelists uh, in this order. We're going to take the two government pan panelists uh, first. Uh, they are being taken in alphabetical order. I don't want to show any favoritism for one continent over the other. Uh, and then we will do the same with the two uh, representatives of NGOs. So uh, we're going to start with uh, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, but Bruno Giancarlo, uh, that, well, my close, I'm close, uh, I'm only close, uh, who, is the, uh, uh, who is the deputy head of the unit at the at DG uh, Justice uh, for the European uh, Commission. Uh, so, Bruno. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to, to be here today. And I will try to briefly tackle, and I have six minutes, uh, briefly touch upon some of the issues raised by the question posed in the conference program. Uh, first, on the proposed directive, um, it's interesting, we, both of you have just been talking about perception. And it's always interesting to note that how our, propose, how our proposal is sometimes criticized for not offering enough protection and not um, being as ambitious as the proposed regulation. And at the same time, we hear from other quarters, and I'm sure my very good friend, Stewart Robinson, will have a lot to say about that, that the directive is likely to affect negatively, uh, to, amp to hamper effective law enforcement cooperation. Well, I must say that just, just uh, the, uh, diversified and conflicting reactions um, and comments can be seen as a good sign, I guess, a sign that our proposal is a balanced one. Um, a balanced approach uh, in terms of uh, objectives and nature of the instrument. I don't have, I guess, to repeat all this, but uh, um, the basic idea here is that uh, law enforcement and the fundamental rights, uh, such as uh, data protection, are not a competing uh, policy objective, uh, but complementary ones. Uh, citizens uh, must uh, trust uh, law enforcement authorities uh, to respect fundamental rights, regardless of whether the personal data is, process, is processed at national level or exchanged across the border uh, within the EU or beyond, and that's why a big step forward of our proposal is that um, the um, uh, proposed uh, directive covers not only uh, cross-border cooperation but also domestic uh, processing. Uh, experience has shown, and experience based uh, mainly on the existing framework decision and other elements of the AKI, that uh, uh, the application of uh, the existing uh, framework has resulted in, in gaps and inconsistencies which have affected both the level of protection for individuals and the mutual trust and cooperation between uh, police and uh, judicial authority. Uh, at the same time, the, the choice of a separate instrument, a directive, was made to take account of the fact that in this uh, sensitive area, uh, flexibility, a certain uh, degree of flexibility uh, uh, should be uh, left to the member states. Um, it should also be noted that the uh, proposed directive provides for minimum amortization 
Uh, in other words, it allows member states uh, to provide for higher safeguard in the interest of uh, individual uh, data uh, subject. Um, a balanced approach also in terms of content of the proposal. Um, if we look at the text, we see a lot of uh, continuity. A lot of what is in the proposal is essentially built on existing uh, concept and principle uh, foreseen under the current framework uh, directive and other, element of, other elements of EU uh, legislation, uh, subject to some clarification uh, and some innovation, uh, which are in the line uh, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, general approach uh, of the, our reform package, a regulation uh, plus a directive with some adaptation to specificities of the law enforcement sector. And the new elements uh, uh, reflect and are inspired uh, in general by well-known and common uh, uh, concepts uh, coming uh, both from national law and from other uh, uh, European and international instruments such as uh, Council of Europe recommendation or uh, the uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, case law. And uh, that is why I must say, and let me use maybe an understatement, that. Um, we have some difficulties uh, to understand uh, from our American friends and to understand our American friends when they describe the proposal as a sort of dramatic sea change uh, compared to the current situation that would have a negative impact on uh, transatlantic and even global enforcement cooperation. Data exchange and, and data transfer are currently uh, taking place uh, between us and the US on the basis of rules uh, uh, that are uh, very similar on the national law, on the EU law, on the uh, uh, other European uh, uh, laws such as uh, the principle deriving from the Convention, uh, from the uh, European Convention of Human Rights that are very uh, similar to those uh, contained in our proposal. There is often a specific uh, concern expressed about uh, the uh, renegotiation uh, of uh, bilateral uh, treaties uh, based uh, on uh, Article 60 of our proposal, that our proposal would um, uh, oblige member states to um, renegotiate most of uh, uh, the bilateral agreements they have in the uh, area of uh, law enforcement. There too, I must say that most of these concerns, we see them as, uh, ve as uh, um, based maybe on some misunderstanding and in any case as uh, exaggerated to a very uh, large extent. Uh, actually, this is nothing new for member states. Uh, the need to bring in line uh, some of the agreements with, which would lack the necessary guarantees in terms of EU data protection uh, is something which is uh, neither new nor uh, the consequence of this specific uh, proposal. It follows from the treaties, it follows from the case though, that member states have an obligation to take all appropriate steps to eliminate uh, any incompatibility with EU legislation uh, that might arise from uh, their international obligation. Um, in addition, we see uh, this aspect of our proposal as something which is essential for a mutual trust between member states. If there are different rules enshrined in uh, bilateral agreements between a member state and a third country with viable level of protection, this could undermine the trust between member states and prevent uh, the exchange of personal data between them uh, when they know that such data may be then transferred to a third uh, country. Um, I could say much more on, on, on this, but uh, it's also important to note that only agreements that involve data sharing, not just any agreement in the field of law enforcement, might have to be reviewed under that uh, uh, provision. Uh, and, and they will have to review only if uh, necessary. Uh, that means that those uh, agreements or arrangements which are sufficiently in line with the data protection framework will, non will not need to be renegotiated. Um, and finally, uh, renegotiation is not the only solution uh, available uh, to address these issues. Um, we are currently having a negotiation uh, with the US 
uh, for a, a comprehensive, uh, what we call an umbrella agreement on the transfer of data uh, for purpose of law enforcement. Um, this umbrella negotiation, as we call them, can be a, a part of the solution. The, the provision of such an agreement could complement uh, the bilateral and the, mutual, the multilateral agreement that may be missing essential uh, safeguards from a data protection for, uh, uh, point of view. So there are a number of uh, techniques that uh, can be used to bring, uh, if need be, uh, uh, these agreements in line with the uh, necessary uh, safeguards. Very briefly, this uh, gives me an opportunity to say a few words more on this uh, current negotiation we are having with um, uh, the US. Uh, after uh, several uh, negotiation rounds, um, we have um, uh, reached As we have agreed on a certain, uh, we have made, made good uh, progress on a number of provisions, uh, including important principles such as uh, data security, transparency of data processing or use, accountability, uh, maintaining the quality and uh, integrity of information, the existence of uh, over effective oversight authority. And we have uh, uh, made uh, substantive uh, progress on this provision, showing that uh, even with uh, systems, uh, with, uh, with respect to systems that have uh, some uh, organizational or more substantial difference, it's uh, uh, possible to, to, to work together and to work together uh, towards uh, uh, such a, uh, an important and comprehensive agreement. Uh, we will continue to work in the following month on a number of areas uh, such as uh, purpose limitation, retention of personal data and uh, effective uh, administrative and uh, judicial redress that uh, are all uh, key issues uh, for the EU. And another important issue, and I'm sure that we will uh, come back on this, another important issue we are addressing uh, with our US counterparts uh, including in the context of this negotiation, is the question of the so-called uh, extraterritorial laws, which uh, can enable enforcement authorities to directly request and access uh, personal data held by private companies, as opposed to channeling this request through existing uh, judicial or police uh, cooperation agreement. We um, believe that uh, the comprehensive uh, umbrella agreement we are negotiating offers an opportunity uh, that both sides uh, should, uh, should uh, say uh, to address these issues um, and to avoid that uh, not only our citizens but our companies on the two sides of the Atlantic uh, can be uh, exposed to uh, a significant uh, legal risk as they are likely to find themselves in breach of either uh, EU or US law when confronted with such requests uh, from law enforcement uh, authorities. In other words, uh, uh, what we are trying uh, to achieve here uh, uh, in, in, trying, in, in working to improve our uh, mutual cooperation uh, uh, is, is based on a very simple uh, idea. Uh, prevention and uh, prosecution of crimes needs to go hand, hand in hand with a high level of uh, protection of uh, personal data and will benefit from a high level of uh, personal of, of protection. Um, as Vice President Redding uh, keeps repeating, uh, personal data has become the currency which makes the world of technology uh, go round. But uh, like any currency, it needs stability and trust. And this is true uh, for the law enforcement sector as, is, as it is true uh, for uh, commercial uh, data. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me first see if I can get your if I can correct the uh, pronunciation of your name, it's, it's Bruno Gincarelli. That's okay. Uh, I also uh, want to, uh, for those of you who may not know, just a point of clarification that uh, may be helpful. It's just 
discussion proceeds. Uh, there, are, there are two documents, as, as most of you know, but some may not know. Uh, there are two documents that uh, the European Commission has put forward, and they're currently before the European Parliament. Uh, there is the regulation, which primarily covers, not exclusively, but primarily covers commercial data. And then there is the directive, which exclusively covers law enforcement matters. Uh, we are discussing the directive here. The, uh, our second speaker is James Robinson, who is uh, uh, the, uh, the the senior the counsel for law enforcement at the uh, United States uh, Mission to the European Union. Uh, he is also a former prosecutor in the United States and a adjunct law professor at a number of the uh, prestigious Washington law schools. Well, thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you for the kind invitation to be part of this uh, distinguished panel uh, today. Uh, I'm a bit uh, different, as you can tell, by looking at uh, the panel. I'm a practitioner. Uh, my background is that I'm a lawyer, I'm a, a prosecutor. I've also represented individuals accused of crimes in the United States. I've worked with colleagues around the world uh, in law enforcement matters. Uh, I want to talk from that perspective uh, to you a bit this afternoon, uh, because that is something that I think is, is uh, lacking and something that, that really is needed, and that's the conversation, uh, the discussion uh, between not only people who are in data privacy and are considered experts, as I'm sure most of you would put yourselves in those categories, uh, but also those in law enforcement, when we're talking about these law enforcement issues and, and particularly about the proposed directive. Because there's some different perspectives here. And there's some misinformation, I think, and some misperception, at least, uh, as to how some of this works. So I want to bring a little bit different uh, viewpoint to the discussion today, perhaps. Uh, and and I, am, I am the only... Uh, law enforcement practitioner on the panel. Uh, one of the things I, I teach, uh, I'm an adjunct professor uh, of law uh, in the US, and I, for a number of years, have taught a law school uh, course that deals with the role of the federal prosecutor. And it's very interesting in these conversations because for 10 years, I have begun and ended that course with the same thing. And that's exactly a discussion of what we're talking about here. And that is that it's always a balance when you're talking about core concerns of society, and that is providing security, providing safety to the people who live and work in a particular community, and at the same time, providing civil liberties, providing rule of law, providing privacy, and providing data protection. It is always a balance. And if you view it through the lens of only one of these, I, I think we're missing the opportunity here. Indeed, it is possible to do both. We should do both. We should protect both of those. And I think it's our obligation, uh, as, certainly as governments, to make sure that we can provide for the safety and security of people around the world and at the same time promote, uh, as the US and the EU are, are leading proponents in, around the world and have been for a long time in this area of civil liberties, privacy, and data protection. I think we have a unique opportunity here. It's very important that we get it right, and if so, I think the engagement and the discussion is extremely important so that we can understand, perhaps, one another a bit better. Uh, one of the things that I can assure you, at least from my perspective, is that I firmly believe that both the U.S. and the European Union share the same fundamental values and principles when it comes to privacy and data protection. Uh, studies between the two have found that before. And I think it is true. The differences are that we approach it in different ways. And this creates, at times, problems. It creates the need to talk and discuss. Bruno and I uh, meet a lot on a lot of uh, issues. And one of the things we do is that we listen to each other and we learn, I think, every time we come together. And I think that's important uh, to do that because not surprisingly, <clears throat> even though we have the same fundamental values, we approach it in different ways and we utilize different systems to protect privacy, to protect data. Over 200 years ago, 
the United States was founded on and its modern laws and its, its uh, statutes, its approach, uh, regulations, as you've seen, a core belief in the importance of protecting citizens from government intrusion. That's a very important concept in the United States and always has been. But to accomplish this, the U.S. utilizes an extensive, multi-layered system of laws, procedures, processes that have been developed over decades and that we believe are extremely effective in protecting individuals against government intrusion. I'll give you a couple examples of that uh, uh, in, in just a moment. But recognizing privacy and protecting data and information at the same time. This can be done and should be done. Now, the EU has an effective system as well, but it does it in a different way in protecting privacy and data. It's based more on a single statutory framework and more centralized enforcement by data protection authorities is what you see. And so you see a different approach to this. Because we have a different approach, I hope it does not mean that we cannot come to agreement on these important issues. And that is the thing that we're moving forward to try to do at this point. The systems are different, but the arguments over which is more effective, in my opinion, are not all that productive because both systems, I think, are highly effective. The U.S. and the E.U., again, are leading proponents of these areas around the world. And as the U.S., as you've seen in the last panel, is currently reviewing parts of its system now on protections, at the same time the E.U. is proposing its data protection frameworks, I think this is a unique opportunity to work together and to get this right. I think it's extremely important we do that. We'd urge that the discussion focus less on the differences in process and more on whether the systems achieve equivalent outcomes. I noted uh, with interest uh, Peter Hustink's comments of December 4th, generally along those lines, and I'm not quoting him directly here, but as I recall it, he said, you know, it wouldn't be difficult to point at differences among data protection laws around the world. And that's often what we do, because it's not just the EU and the United States. It's over 200 countries around the world that we want to influence and that we want to and that we're going to be dealing with and that we're interconnected with. He says perhaps it's more constructive to look at the growing convergence of data protection principles and practices around the world. And indeed there is growing convergence, I think. It doesn't mean that you have to adopt one system, however, and can we be flexible enough uh, in which we can do that. Well, there are a number of issues uh, that uh, we may discuss today. Uh, talking about law enforcement and national security just very briefly because one only has to look at the awful events of last week in Algeria, uh, the situation in Mali, to know uh, that threats against national security and democracies around the world continue. They are real. Whether we want to realize that or not or accept it or not, it is real and it must be dealt with. That does not mean that we don't take into account privacy and security because those are key elements of both of our societies. And we need to find ways to do that. In law enforcement, it is the same. What you see is really very interesting. Uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago perhaps, Europol's new cybercrime center uh, and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security uh, entered into a letter of intent to reinforce cooperation, law enforcement cooperation, which is so critical. Uh, in, in cases with regard to cybercrime investigations. Two recent uh, cases were highlighted, and they're just examples. Unfortunately, they are not that unusual. One was known as Operation Sunflower. It involved efforts on both sides of the Atlantic, which led to the arrest of 245 people dealing with the sexual exploitation of children online, and rescued over 120 children. That's important. You work together to do those. The second one that was mentioned uh, was an investigation in which Dutch authorities were assisted in the arrest and prosecution of a man who abused 83 children, the youngest of which was less than one year old. This exists in our world. It is sad, but it does. 
The only way that you can be successful and the only way that these investigations, as well as investigations into drug trafficking, into the trafficking in persons, into fraud that takes away the livelihoods of those who live and work in our communities, it involves the successful law enforcement sharing of information and the passage of personally identifiable information regarding suspects and victims, both bilaterally and multilaterally. It must be done carefully. And I think, and I hope that it is, it's a constant process that we're always trying to improve in this. But in the last two decades, the member states of the European Union, the United States, and countries around the world have worked very hard to develop frameworks to deal with this, both bilaterally and multilaterally. To come in and say we want to change all of that is going to create quite a, a different response, and I think you're going to see a different response from law enforcement and from the member states themselves when you start talking about the realities of these issues. How do you do it and do it effectively? Uh, David, if you don't mind, if you can wrap up in about a minute, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I do that. I talk for a living and I get carried away and I will, uh, I will move over that. The, uh, the U.S. does indeed have concerns. Uh, Bruno has mentioned uh, a few with the directive. It's not the concept of it. it, it it's laudable goals. We're trying to work together and talk together. But one involves the renegotiation of international agreements. There are hundreds of international agreements and arrangements in law enforcement just between the United States and the member states. To renegotiate those, if they don't comport with the directive, and the directive has certain things in it that reflect the system in the, uh, in the EU, a European system of data protection, which all countries do not adapt. The United States has a different method, and other countries around the world do as well. So we're concerned with about that, as well as with the multilateral conventions. Also, the concept of adequacy findings uh, by the Commission before uh, routine international cooperation that we've had currently in the sharing of law enforcement information can be maintained. Again, one of the criteria is, do you have a European-style system? We would hope that we'd look to outcomes and not the form constantly with this, and we're in discussions and talking about that. We've talked about some other areas, too, that we have concern with. One, you heard from your last uh, panel on regulation. Which, which of these instruments covers regulation, which you can be talking about administrative, civil, you can also refer criminal uh, matters to them banking and security regulators. These things affect our financial markets if they can't share that information freely. So it's very important that we talk about this. So I'll stop at this point. Sorry that I went over, Barry, uh, and, and we'll come back later and talk about some specifics. That's why there's a lot of important information. Uh, our, our next speaker is Anna Fielder, who is uh, my colleague and friend uh, from uh, Privacy International. And Anna uh, will, I think, be talking about, the, also talking about the, the proposed directive. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, I've been asked to talk mainly about the directive, but I'll start with a couple of general remarks following what the colleague from the government speaker said, and then I'll let Jay continue on that. Um, my, I mean, we happen to be one of the ones that have criticized the directive severely, so uh, together with, for example, EDPS and the Article 29 Working Party, and I was very curious when, uh, uh, Bruno, you said a balanced approach, um, and you said the balanced approach was between the EU and the US. I mean, would the EU, I mean, this is a question to discuss later, would the EU seek such balanced approaches with other big rising superpowers, for example, China? I don't know, it's just a question. Um, the, the, other, the other sort of, general question that occurred to me when I was uh, listening to Stuart was that you haven't mentioned at all in your presentation what I heard this morning mentioned several times, the differentiated approach uh, in the way the US regards US citizens and EU citizens, so perhaps we can talk about that a little bit later. 
Um, so I just will go back to what I was going to say initially. Um, we are not very happy about the directive, and I'll just mention briefly a few unhappy points. Um, the uh, colleagues in a panel earlier this morning were talking about the directive and there was quite a lot of consensus on those points as well. So I'm, I'm just going to be sort of general rather than go uh, in detail. Um, but the first point I wanted to say is that actually um, the current situation in the, in the European member states is that the vast majority have applied to their law enforcement uh, although they were not obliged to, the directive that is currently in force. So, so the current directive is applied for, you know, in, in the UK, for example, the Data Protection Act, which, uh, uh, which implemented the directive, applies to everything. There's, and, and obviously there are exception and so exceptions uh, for the law sector, but essentially there's one law. And this is one of the major causes why some of the member states are not happy with a directive or want to turn the regulation into a directive because they actually do want one law. Um, and, and there are practical reasons for that because um, as we've discussed in the UK a lot with the police authorities as well, they, they don't see how they will differ differentiate between a regulation and a directive when they do different actions. You know, some of their actions are not for law enforcement, for example. So, so that's one point. Uh, but the most important um, issue for us are the fundamental rights of the citizens, of course. Um, and, and law enforcement is, a, as, as you both remarked, is a really sensitive area of processing. It involves victims, it involves vulnerable people, it involves witnesses, uh, it involves DNA, biometric data, and so on. Um, and uh, just to use again UK as an example, because it's the country I know better, the National Police Database in the UK has on it about six million innocent people with all this sensitive data. So to us, to have differentiated, weaker data protection rules for that section of the population that needs it more than those protected on the commercial <coughs> basis doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, I just want to say a couple of words about the transfer rules in the directive. Um, I mean, it, it is weaker almost on all counts. DPAs don't, um, uh, authorities don't have the same powers. The principles are weaker. Uh, purpose limitation is weaker and so on. But that was um, discussed in, in detail this morning, so I'm not going to repeat it. Um, but a couple of extra words on transfers to third countries. The rules apparently do not prevent transfer of data to non-competent authorities, recipients. In some cases, controllers may be able to self-assess whether or not to send data to a third country, whether or not that country has been identified as adequate. Derogation from the transfer rules are very broad. Controllers are not required to inform data subject of transfers to other member states. So, so how can that support democratic values? Um, so I will, I will end with the initial remarks here, but I think we, I very much hope that we broaden the discussion to national security issues and other things like that after Jay has his say. Thank you, Anna. Our last speaker on the panel is uh, Jay Stanley. Jay uh, also is a, is a colleague and friend. There is a pattern there. Uh, who, uh, he is, uh, is the uh, senior advisor, do I have that correct, Jay, to uh, the uh, to a new project at the ACLU on free speech uh, pri and privacy, uh, and author of, uh, editor rather, of a blog, which I highly recommend, called Free Future, if you, if you uh, uh, if you go to the ACLU.org, ACLU you, uh, you can sign up to, to receive that blog. Thanks, Barry. Um, so I wanted to kick off with um, Stuart's remarks about everything is about balance, and I think that's certainly true. 
The question, of course, is identifying when things are out of balance. And from our perspective, um, the situation in the United States is unfortunately quite out of balance. Um, and that's a problem for the United States. It's a problem when it tries to deal internationally with other countries which, while they may have their debates and they may have their problems, are not as out of balance, uh, perhaps. Um, the fact is the U.S. is an outlier on the world privacy stage. Uh, we have no overarching data protection law comparable to the European Privacy Directive. The few sectoral laws that we have in areas like finance and healthcare are weak and generally riddled with holes. Um, and the privacy protections of our Fourth Amendment, which while very, very strong in certain areas, um, are not nearly as strong and sweeping as uh, things like the European Declaration of Rights, the, the, uh, the e ECHR. Um, and U.S. protections are even less protective of Europeans' privacy than they are of Americans. The Privacy Act applies only to U.S. citizens. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, um, permits the interception of EU communications in cases where it doesn't permit the interception of Americans' intercept uh, information. And protection for electronic privacy law and electronic commu communications in particular is marked by gaping holes. The main U.S. electronic privacy law, ECPA, was enacted in 1986 and is vastly out of date. Um, we have a confusing patchwork system of laws. The Ninth Circuit in the U.S. called it a confusing and uncertain area of the law. For example, an email message in the U.S. is subject to multiple different legal standards during its lifetime based on irrational criteria such as its age and whether it's stored or in transit. Um, the Fourth Amendment jurisprudence in the U.S. is has generally failed to keep up with modern living. Um, we have this thing called the third party doctrine under which any information that is shared with a third party, including a cloud service provider um, or the phone company in some cases, uh, loses all constitutional privacy protection. And there's a, there's a distinction in US law between the content of communications and metadata or the transactional information, such as who the two parties in the communication are, the time, and so forth when, the, when, the, when that uh, communication took place. Um, and law enforcement only needs to certify the likely relevance to a criminal investigation to access that data, which in many cases can be at least as, or if not more, sensitive than the content of a message. For example, uh, by looking at a, a college student's contacts, you can tell in a great, uh, a great proportion of the time whether that person is gay or straight. Um, and then location data. The U.S. government is arguing that location data should not receive constitutional privacy protections, even though that, too, can be incredibly sensitive and, and reveal all kinds of things about you, such as what political organizations, religious organizations, doctors, specialists that you visit, and so forth. Um, so that's on sort of the law enforcement side. And on the national security side, the U.S. has sweeping authorities to spy in the name of national security. The FISA Amendments Act, we often hear about the Patriot Act, but the FISA Amendments Act in some ways is the most significant piece of legislation in this area. Um, it authorizes the government to engage in dragnet sweeping monitoring of communications between an individual inside and an individual outside of the United States. The government doesn't have to disclose its targets to, to any court. It doesn't have to suspect that the targets are criminals. It doesn't have to identify to the court the email addresses, phone numbers, or telecommunication switches that it's monitoring. It allows the government to seek year-long general surveillance orders from a secret court if a quote-unquote significant purpose of its year-long surveillance program is to acquire quote-unquote foreign intelligence. Um, there's no limit on the data, of the use of the data that's collected. Um, so we get huge databases stored forever, shared with anyone, reused for any purpose. Um, and then. A, the Patriot Act, Section 215, uh, we know authorizes the government to access vast uh, data sets from third parties, national security letters, subpoenas that the government can require, uh, seeking data that is quote unquote relevant to a counterterrorism or counterintelligence investigation. There have been numerous serious abuses of that, uh, uh, unsurprisingly, because it's so secret. Um, and which brings us to another sort of point that I want to make here, which is that we're seeing a very disturbing, dangerous trend in the United States of secret law. It's bad enough that there is so much secrecy within the national security establishment, but when you're talking about secret law, that is cutting to the heart of the democratic system of government. We have a, a, a case in which we're trying to get from the FBI memos that we know the FBI has, and FBI counsel waved them at a, at a panel just like this, uh, stating the FBI's interpretation of a recent Supreme Court decision on GPS tracking. 
the FBI has given this uh, interpretation to its people, won't share it publicly, we're having to sue. Uh, FISA court opinions, the secret FISA court, the administration has refused to release. Uh, the Patriot Act, Section 215, which I just mentioned, Senator Udall said that the American people will be stunned and will be angry when they learn how the government is interpreting this law. Uh, Wyden said that the government's relying on a shocking interpretation of FISA. Uh, and of course, judicial oversight has often been uh, very weak on privacy. Um, judicial reviews often been unsuccess uh, successfully avoided through the claims of secrecy. Which brings me to the next point, which is oversight. Um, I said that the U.S. is kind of an outlier in privacy. It's one of only two OECD nations, the other one in Japan, that do not have an independent privacy or data protection official. Uh, law without means of enforcement becomes weakened over time, and that's what we've seen in the United States. Some federal agencies do have chief privacy officers, but they're appointed by and they report to the heads of those agencies, and there are many uh, agencies that have no chief privacy officer. There is an institution called the PCLOB, or Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which was created five years ago and has remained vacant uh, for most of that period. It now finally has four members. Uh, they're currently seeking office space in Washington, D.C. and trying to build a website. They don't have a chairman yet uh, after, this, after the entire first Obama administration and much of the last Bush administration. And it's just indicative of the lack of seriousness, the lack of willpower, uh, uh, for, and, and, and the resistance of the, the executive branch to submitting to, uh, to oversight. So the result is that all kinds of things are happening in the United States. Cell phone tracking, license plate scanners, uh, we're seeing the, the emergence of surveillance drones, there's watch list programs, where there's no counterbalancing institutional uh, force pushing for privacy. So, you know, I think that the, my main point here is that the U.S. is sort of a nation out of balance. Um, the EU has companies with an interest in relaxing privacy and it certainly has a national security establishment. But both of those forces in the U.S. have sort of not been confined to their, to their proper scale and scope and, and power. Um, and the fact that the U.S. government in, in the current debate here in Europe is pushing so hard uh, and lobbying so hard to, to, to lower privacy standards is a very sad thing for me. Uh, for, for, I like to think of my country as, as, as a leader in the world, as a defender of, of individual rights and individual freedom. Um, but we have a very, very large and bloated and, 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 and excessively powerful and secretive national security establishment, which seems to have uh, uh, get its way in the White House whenever there's a, there's, a, there's a debate or an issue. And we're seeing that in this case. And I think that in some ways what my final point is I think in some ways because of the, the, the rapid growth of technology, uh, the failure to keep uh, Fourth Amendment jurisprudence up to date, um, and a welter of laws like the Patriot Act passed after 9-11, I think that U.S. law enforcement community has gotten accustomed to a, to a certain lack of oversight, uh, that uh, lack of commensurate, or a level of oversight that doesn't meet what we need to, to, uh, to, to fit the values that we've been talking about. And I think that um, as the EU moves to advance its own laws, we need to see the U.S. work with the EU um, to, to increase its own, bring its own standards up and not try and keep the EU standards down. Thank you, Jay. So the panel's now uh, spoken and uh, you've heard each other's uh, viewpoints. I want to briefly see whether or not anyone would like to uh, comment on what you've heard or add anything to what you said earlier. Don't feel uh, constrained to do it, but if, you, if you'd like to take a moment to do so, uh, please do. Jim. It was a surprise I pick up the microphone here. So uh, uh, let me just briefly comment on something, and then we'll get into to other areas, I'm sure. But um, uh, a lot has been... <laughs> I have a very different perspective, let me put it this way, uh, than, than Jay has just laid out, I think, about certain areas. And part of that has to do with oversight, weaker, weaker requirements. Do you realize that to get content, and, and this is something that, that people always come staring back, and yet if there's anybody in law enforcement, which I doubt in this room, is there anybody in the room with law enforcement? Okay, good. The member states are constantly 
uh, complaining to us about the, the situation of why do we have to comply with the higher standards of the United States to get content of, of uh, emails, to get uh, certainly uh, real-time interception of electronic uh, communications or voice communications. It requires probable cause. It requires an independent court. You're not going to see this elsewhere. They're among the highest standards in the world. They're different. They are different. They are not weaker. They are not in some areas. Uh, you can talk about various things here, but you must keep, <laughs> I would hope, the balance and the perspective of what is really happening here. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to take questions in a little bit. The, the other thing is that, that Jay mentioned uh, uh, under the Patriot Act, 215 uh, orders. 215 orders are obtained by a court. They are very rarely used. Testimony before Congress uh, shows those, and, and I think people that follow that all the time know that. Uh, if you're talking about national security letters, you realize you can't get content with those? None. Zip. You cannot use those for that purpose. And so understanding what, how all of this fits together, I think, is very important. The U.S. does have strong, strong protections. Uh, can they be improved? Of course they can be improved. We're always developing this. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I am going to enforce the two-minute limit on these, these answers, okay. uh, if you don't mind. Are there other, other people who would like to comment? Go ahead. Uh, very briefly, a balanced approach, when I was talking about balanced approach, balanced approach to law, enforcement, to law enforcement and fundamental rights, I was not was referring to our directive and not directly to dialogue we have with the U.S. And uh, I was um, referring to, to them as uh, complementary objectives and not opposing objectives. And I think Steve would say the same thing when referring to the U.S. system about how uh, this is a balancing exercise. Um, on the framework decision and the difference between the framework decision and the, current, and the proposed directive, I couldn't agree more that it doesn't make, to make, it doesn't, uh, make uh, any sense uh, to distinguish between uh, domestic and cross-border uh, transfers. And, uh, and, that, uh, and that's what, what we have made, and that's one of the main reasons why we have uh, put that proposal on the table. It doesn't make sense to distinguish it both from a practical point of view uh, uh, for law enforcement authorities, and then, and, 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 and then for, uh, first and foremost from an uh, individual protection point of view. On transfers on adequacy, I don't agree that uh, adequacy, as maybe you have explained, uh, uh, Stewart, is about um, looking for an identical system. Adequacy is not about uh, copy-paste, it's not about uh, photocopy. Adequacy is about finding a system that provides for the same, for a similar level of, of protection from a, a functional point of view. Different, they might be different organization, deep, different approaches, different mechanisms point of view, but one, clearly one of a, a, a fundamental element in that respect is uh, to have a robust administrative and uh, judicial uh, redress uh, system. Um, I don't think that, I don't believe that the provision on international uh, transfers are particularly uh, weak uh, uh, in our proposed directive or don't offer a sufficient level of uh, protection. First, because they shouldn't be read in isolation uh, uh, if they should be uh, read uh, in combination with the provisions dealing with uh, the powers and the role of supervisory authorities. You know, if you could just wrap up. Yes. Yes, sir. And uh, it's very difficult <laughs> to be brief on all of this, but I guess we will come back. And, and, uh, um, and then, because um, uh, if you look at each of the three articles, uh, they are uh, specifically a frame and um, provide for an, an, a number of safeguards on which we, we, we can come back. Other members of the panel want to add anything? Anna? Well, um, Sorry, Simon. Do you go first? Okay. Just, just, just one very quick thing. If we have a minute toward the end, Stuart, can you explain to me when you say, don't do it now, but uh, when you say it doesn't really matter if our systems are different as long as the ends are met, is that, 
That doesn't square with me. I don't, as I understand it, legal systems have to have like for like, apples for apples, uh, for, for a range of different reasons. Um, if you could explain at some point, if we have time, why that isn't the ends justify the means. I'd like to keep the order here. Um, yes, uh, a couple of comments um, to what Bruno said. Um, the, um, the amendments of Mr. Drutzas, I'm pleased to see, they've brought up the provisions in the directive to make them much more in line with those in the regulations. So, um, you know, we hope that uh, they're not going to be um, amended and re-amended further to make them weaker. So um, that's one comment. Um, the, the other comment I wanted to make is in relation to what Jay said. He did mention, he did mention very clearly that the uh, US uh, patchwork of privacy laws, um, as they are, certainly do not apply to the, to the citizens that are not US citizens. So my question is, if, um, if my personal information um, is scraped in an avalanche of, of sort of other information and I suffer visibly um, a big detriment, uh, which, you know, half the time I wouldn't know, but I might find out and, and it can happen to me. Um, if I am um, in Europe, um, if I'm in Europe, uh, at least I have a recourse uh, to the European Court of Human Rights, not to, Europe, not to EU institutions because the EU institutions do not cover national security. But I can go under the Convention 108 to the European Court. Um, will US sign the Convention 108? You signed the um, Cybercrime Convention. Why not Convention 108? And then that will bring things a little bit nearer. And, um, and uh, to, re to respond to Stuart, um, who I greatly uh, sympathize with being here in the, the, uh, the, in the middle of all of us, I've been there. Um, you know, I think that, you know, you talked about how the U.S. and the EU have shared values, and I think that is true. I just feel like the U.S. laws are not living up to our values, um, they, especially in the digital age where the laws have failed to keep up with the realities of how people communicate with each other today, which is through third-party companies like Google and Facebook um, and so forth. And there certainly are areas of the U.S. law that are very strong uh, thanks to our Constitution um, and the content of emails in many circumstances. One of them, although even there it's, it's being eroded by the national security, um, you know, things I talked about. Um, so I think that, you know, th that that, that instead of instead of this focus of trying to keep things the way they are and 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 this, this defensive concern about what the EU directive will do to U.S. law enforcement practices, we would like to see the administration, you know, turn look 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 at, look at itself in the mirror a little bit more and 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 work on improving privacy for Americans. And if if if, if what you say is true that that both countries really get the same end result, then a lot of these problems may go away. But the results in the United States right now are not adequate. We're going, to, we're going to go for about another five minutes with the panel. Then we're going to take questions, Kemper. Uh, uh, I mostly want to give Simon an opportunity to ask his question uh, when, when we get to the, uh, to the point of questions. But, I, but I'm going to take the, uh, the moderator's prerogative here uh, and, and ask a couple of questions myself. Uh, first, I'd like to hear a bit more about the uh, umbrella agreement. Uh, that's being negotiated between the United States uh, and the uh, and the EU uh, on the transfer of personal data in the law enforcement national security context. And the question uh, we, at, at least on our side of the pond, are hearing different things about how likely it is uh, that that agreement will be negotiated. So, if uh, if our government representatives could say a bit about what, where they think that agreement stands, how it will. Uh, relate to the uh, European uh, uh, Privacy Directive if, is, if it is adopted, uh, and then the uh, NGO representatives may wish to comment on whether or not uh, uh, a, uh, a bilateral agreement between the United States and the European Union is sufficient. Anyone is free to uh, answer that question. 
can start with the, uh, uh, with the government representatives here. Let me very, all, all I think what we can tell you is we're working very hard at this. This is difficult because it requires an understanding, and again, the misperceptions, it, I don't even know where to go with all of this, the things that I've heard in just the last minute of, of streaming by that are taken as givens, and, and, and they're not correct. They're certainly not correct from my experience in 30 years of dealing with the U.S. system. This isn't the way it is, but it's, it, it seems to be accepted by, by some, and I mean, there are, well, let me stay on the subject. <laughs> with regard to the, to the uh, umbrella agreement, uh, we are working very hard with this. Will it solve all the issues? No, it won't because it's bilateral. It's between the U.S. and the EU. You know, there are over 200 other countries out there that are going to have some of the same problems. Uh, and so, uh, but we're working very hard at it. We will continue, and I can tell you that everybody on both sides is very dedicated to this, and it's extremely difficult work. What can I add? That we are working uh, harder, and that we, it's a, no, it's a, it's a difficult work, but it's an important, a very important opportunity. Um, we have indicated, um, we don't think that there's a contradiction between what we are doing internally and uh, uh, what, what, what we are negotiating. Uh, um, we uh, see this also uh, in, a, in a broader context, um, and we see encouraging signs uh, from the other side of the Atlantic, for instance, in the commercial sector, that the idea of having um, a legislative instrument uh, is uh, emerging. Um, so, meaning there's, there's, a, there's a momentum uh, to say, and um, uh, we uh, think that we can uh, seize that momentum and uh, uh, ensure good, if not excellent, uh, cooperation uh, across the Atlantic uh, and the cooperation uh, based on, on, on high standards. And that's, what, and that's why it's so difficult to work on, the, on, on this file. But uh, and, uh, we have, as I indicated, on certain issues we have made progress. Um, there are uh, toughest issues that, 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 uh, on which we, we still have, have uh, uh, to work a lot, and not surprisingly, those are, are the issues um, uh, which uh, arise from, uh, can I call them, the differences between our system or the lack of similarity between our system in terms of uh, uh, redress, uh, in terms of some specific rules on uh, retention, purpose, limitation. So, so, so Anna, I know you wanted to comment on this as well. Uh, no, I, want, I just wanted to say that we have very little time, so it would be nice to hear from the audience as well. I think Casper wanted to we're, say... We're going to take questions. We, we've agreed right. with the... Well, uh, I, I mean, I, I'd rather... Yes, we, we, we've agreed here. We, no, we, we, we've agreed with, uh, with Rocco that we will take questions at 6 o'clock, which we're almost approaching. Other questions, other comments on that question? If not, I have one more question before we turn to the, uh, to the, to the audience, uh, uh, which is uh, just a yes or no answer from the panel uh, on the question of whether or not you think that uh, uh, the United States and the Europe, uh, uh, Europe do have a uh, uh, significant difference uh, in their approach to privacy in the area of law enforcement. If you could. If you could just restrict yourself to uh, to yes or no, I'll, I'm going to I'm going to go down the down the. Uh, uh, I'll give you one set yes or no with one sentence following yes or no. I'll just go down the list here. Uh, I'll go in uh, in uh, in order here, Bruno. Can I abstain? No. Um, <laughs> A significant different uh, meaning. Uh, I will answer no, but uh, with uh, significant uh, issues uh, that need to be uh, addressed and solved. Uh, <clears throat> structurally, uh, given the history and development, yes, uh, they're different. Uh, but I think you'll find if, if the time is spent to look at the 27 member states, I think you're going to find uh, that uh, a lot of the, the similar um, uh, results of are occurring here, but in different structure. That's too many sentences. That's, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know what to say. Um, compared to the Congo, they're similar. Compared to Canada, 
they're dissimilar. I don't know what else to say. Sorry, Barry. Uh, y yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we're, we're going to move to, to, to questions here. Uh, we're just going to take a couple. Uh, I'm going to, we'll ask the, uh, that, you at, that you pose your question. Please make, make it a question, not a, uh, not a comment. Uh, and we will just take uh, two, or two questions at a time here uh, and then let, let the panel uh, answer them. We'll start with Casper. At last, thank you. Um, this question is directed to Mr. Robinson. Um, on the US-EU mission website dealing with data protection, there is a large amount of deceptive propaganda. In particular, none of the materials make any reference to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Amendment Act, Section 1881A which is, I think, one of the most pertinent things to discuss. They barely mention the Patriot Act, but the fundamentally disingenuous proposition that you have again repeated today is it is not interesting to Europeans to know what protections apply to American citizens inside America. We am sure, I'm sure they're very, very good. And we have pions to the Fourth Amendment sung at every international conference. The point is it doesn't apply to the rest of the world. If one is not a US citizen and if one is located outside the US, the Fourth Amendment does not apply, and moreover, one can be targeted for mass surveillance. And, and the, under question, the question is what? So I would like to ask Mr. Robinson can he give us an assurance today that we will have no more of this deceptive propaganda implying that Fourth Amendment protection is relevant? And if he'd also some, to say something about 1881A, then that would be a first from a US spokesperson. Okay, we're going to take a cup just. To get them on the table, we'll take a second question, and then we will turn to the panel to to answer the, another, any other questions from the, from the floor here. Uh, over here. I Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm Paul Bernal from the University of East Anglia. I just have a, a question for everybody: if there are, if they think there are lessons to be learned from the progress or lack of progress of the Communications Data Bill in the UK, and if you haven't followed it, I hope you have. Um, it was effectively um, very actively criticised by a parliamentary committee after a great deal of input from civil society and others. And I think it's one of the first times we've had a, a bill defeated in that, that kind of way. So are there lessons to learn for the future of privacy in law enforcement? So let's uh, allow people to answer that question. Do you want to tackle uh, Casper's uh, question first, James? Or would you like to, Anna, would you like to tackle the... Uh, well, um, Privacy International was very involved in this. Um, I don't know whether Gas or Eric would like to say anything, or indeed Peter from uh, Open Rights Group, who is here. Um, but, but there was a lot of NGO cooperation and a concerted campaign, I think. So obviously what we have to do in this case, a lot of cross-European and with our US colleagues NGO campaigning and cooperation to try and influence our um, powers that be to change things. So James, there was a question posed specifically for you if you were, uh, the, uh, uh, the Fifth Amendment does apply here if you care to, uh, to assert your right to, to not answer, that's for, you're fine doing that, but uh, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity. I'm sorry, who are you? I, there was a question that was posed specifically for you. My name's Stuart, I'm sorry. That, I'm sorry, you called me, you said James, and I, was, I don't think we have a James on the panel. Let me assure you that no one is being disingenuous. Perhaps one of the situations of the United States and the way that uh, we do some of the things, uh, we're certainly, uh, we certainly need to develop uh, there's certainly improvements that can be made. Be careful with calling people disingenuous, please. I would say this, that one of the things about the U.S. system, the transparency of having a FISA, a statute, that's public. You can read it. You're not going to find that with every country around the world, you're not going to find that with all of the EU member states. It's not going to happen. And you say, well, because we're competing against ourselves, because there is a high standard and now there's another standard that may put us on par with other countries, including countries in the European Union, 
with regard to how they gather particular information, not vast gatherings of things. <clears throat> These have to be uh, intelligence. Uh, it has to be national security. Uh, and your, your interpretation of the Fourth Amendment is a bit overly broad. Uh, it does not mean that just because you are not a U.S. citizen that it's not covered by that. The cases are broader than that. Uh, it's one of those things that these, these um, uh, assertions that are made are troubling because they take a long time to sit down and go through situations and say, here's where something would apply, here's where something would not apply. Uh, simplistic answers are very, very difficult in a complex world. Uh, but uh, I, I can assure you that the information that uh, we have put out on the USEU website, uh, the comments of, uh, of Ambassador Kennard uh, are uh, totally, uh, uh, they are being totally genuine in, in the responses here, and I think you're going to find they're accurate. Now, we can disagree, and people do disagree, and lawyers disagree all the time, and there's some things before the courts right now. We'll see what the Supreme Court says uh, about some of this as well. So. so we have time for only really one more question. Is there a question for the audience? Uh, let's see if there's someone else would like to ask a question. Yes. Good. I can't, I, I can't really see. I know it's a female hand, but it's more like the people here. Hello, I'm Christina Irion from Budapest. I have a question on uh, the role of immunities that are granted to uh, uh, providers of telecommunications and electronic services, and, and whether this is actually not uh, creating a situation that is more giving an incentive to uh, overstep, for example, legal rules and uh, protections and safeguards in place, and whether it should not be handled the opposite, that also providers have uh, an obligation to check carefully if they have to comply with a certain order. Thank you. Is there anyone who would like to respond to that question? All right. If, if not, we have time for one more question, then. Well, very briefly, yes. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the panel un understood the, the question, particularly of, of where it's coming from. But there, there can certainly be challenges uh, to a request, uh, and, and those are uh, under U.S. law, under member state law. I don't know. You, you've got you've got 27 member states, and, and so uh, I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not familiar with that. So, uh, Baron Soko, Tech Freedom. We've worked hard as a U.S. NGO to increase protections in, against government access. But I'm surprised to hear today that there's been no mention of the Jones decision that actually took an important step towards uh, implementing Fourth Amendment values. There was no mention of the fact that the Senate passed ECPA reform to extend the warrant requirement for content last Congress, and that seems to be moving forward in the House. And also, uh, there's a 2011 case, Microsoft versus Suzlon, where the Ninth Circuit recognized uh, an alien's right under ECPA to recover where a I'm sorry, provider. do you have a question? Do you have a question? Yeah, so my question is, isn't there a good news story here? Isn't the situation in the U.S. getting better? I think there, there are certainly, there is certainly good news amongst all the news. Um, and the, uh, the Jones decision, which the Supreme Court ruled that for the police to put a GPS tracker on your car is in fact a search under the Fourth Amendment. Uh, they didn't reach the question of whether or not they need a warrant for it. That's, now that's being fought out. Um, uh, that was a wonderful privacy decision. It represented the first time that the Supreme Court really began to grapple with the complexities that a lot of these new technologies are bringing to privacy issues. Um, of course, the irony here, is I, and I did mention the, the, that case a little bit in the context of the uh, Justice Department has interpreted that, what that Supreme Court decision means for the actual practices of the FBI in how they use GPS trackers, and they refuse to uh, to make to, to to let anybody see that interpretation. Um, and so, and, and you know, along the lines of that, um, Stuart, you mentioned that you know it's it's good that we do have FISA as an open written law, and I agree with you. I think it's great, um, but of course, there is the downside that the way it's being interpreted is secret. We're hearing that the, these laws are being. Um, interpreted in radical ways 
we've seen a history of the U.S. government really pushing the boundaries in, in interpreting, in, in its legal interpretations um, in the torture area and other areas in the, in, you know, in, the, in, the, in the 2000s. So, I mean, writing a law is only half the battle. How a law is interpreted is a vast amount of that. And if that's secret, then it undermines much of the uh, original sort of victory. So. Okay, so, so we have reached the end of our time. I want to thank the panel uh, for a very spirited discussion. For the, uh, I want to thank you and the audience for uh, staying so late. Thank you.